continuing the series in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 to 15. So, uh, Rachel, over to you. Thank you. Okay, so chapter 17, starting from verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. For the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down and have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money and security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for, si for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. <clears throat> Amen. Good. Well, let's look at God's word together, shall we, as we... Um as we just had it read to us before from Rachel, uh, this series that you're in at the moment in Acts of the Apostles, this infant church, the uh, new Christians, uh, with all of the things that's kind of happening to them, all the stuff that's happened so far. Uh, we're up to chapter 17, or you're up to chapter 17, and um, amazing story, isn't it, of God's, of, of the dunamis, the dynamite of the Holy Spirit uh, blazing out from Jerusalem, into Judea and uh, Ju uh, Jerusalem, Judea at the end, and Samaria and the utmost parts of the world. I was trying to get me concentric circles right then, sorry about that. <laughs> and to the utmost parts of the world. God's unfolding plan. I think I mentioned this last time because I think it came back when you were on chapter five or something like that. And um, God's unfolding plan being enacted through God's unstoppable word, isn't it? And so you see, it's as many have probably said to you, we call it the Acts of the Apostles written on the page, but it's actually the Acts of the Holy Spirit as he works through the Apostles, through the Word of God, Spirit and the Word working together as it always has been, always will be in us today as well. Uh, a great unfolding story that's still unfolding. 28 chapters in Acts, we're in Acts 29 at the moment, aren't we? And uh, many a story could be written about the church as it's grown since those days early on. But God's word spreading. And, and the, 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 gospel, the book of Acts, Luke's second chapter, if you like, second volume, uh, the first volume being his gospel, now to the story of the church, and, and constantly kind of puts these little kind of spaces in. And uh, as he recounts the different things that are going on, he says, and the word of God spread. And the word of God continued to spread. And the people spoke boldly. It's all acts of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? God's word is powerful. And that's what we're going to learn tonight here uh, in this chapter. We learn in all the chapters, actually. as we, It's all about God's word through his, his, his unstoppable plan, I say. His unstoppable word 
And uh, we see that at Pentecost and the, when, when the Holy Spirit comes down, what does he do? He gives them a word to preach in all sorts of different languages so everyone can understand. This is a word for everyone. It's a powerful word. It doesn't matter what culture or background you're from, it changes you and makes you more like, uh, makes you wise unto salvation, helps you to understand Jesus. And as a Christian, it helps you to make, make you more like him. Powerful, powerful word. We've read about Paul, the church planter, who looked uh, in chapter 15, a couple of chapters ago, talked about he goes back strengthening the churches through the word of God, teaching, explaining, equipping. It's the ministry of, of, of uh, the apostle, isn't it? But also the ministry of ministers in the church today that we might equip the saints for works of service. But we don't do it through clever thoughts or schemes. We do it through what? The word of God. It's the word of God that builds churches. It's the word of God that builds lives, Christian lives. It's the foundation for everything. It's the only building block we need through the Holy Spirit being applied to our lives. That's how God says it. That's how God does it. And God always has. And last time, last Sunday, you looked at chapter 16, the Macedonian call and how the Holy Spirit it closes doors and opens doors and allows God's people to be in the place he wants them to be. We waste so much time worrying about whether God, God's saying to us and whether he's guiding us and praying for his guide. I think that's great to do that. I'm not saying it's wrong, but God has no limit on the ways he can get our attention in order to guide us if, he, if we're listening, mainly through his word. How many times has God done that to you? And I know certainly for us as well. And so last time we saw this planted church, and again, who else but God would build a church with a, a Lydia, a wealthy businesswoman, a slave girl, and a jailer as some of its members? A, a diverse church. Christianity is wonderful, isn't it? The world is trying to, through all sorts of means, to make itself as diverse as possible, particularly in the West. And they to go through all sorts of hoops to try and get there. And God just says, whosoever will may come, everybody. Whatever, whatever sort of background you come from, whatever culture you are, God's, my word is applicable to your life. Because the wonderful thing is at the heart of the Christian message is everyone's the same. Every, we're all made in the image of God. Whatever we are like on the outside, whatever intellect we might have or any other sort of status in life we might call it, we're all the same, aren't we? And particularly as we come, the, the centerpiece of some of our services, the communion table, we're all naked and embarrassed as we come there because we need the cross, we need grace, we need Jesus. No one any, it's, the only place, it's the first place in that New Testament where slave and master sat down together and ate together because they did it at the foot of the cross. The unity was in Christ. Wonderful, isn't it? These are, it's a great story, isn't it? I love the book of Acts, you can probably tell, but I do love the book of Acts. It's so exciting to see and we living in those days, we, we should be living in those days today. But this particular chapter, chapter 17, I've, I've kind of called it the word at work. The word at work. We see it in different ways here in this chapter. And I don't, as yeah, I say, hopefully it won't take too long over it. I know it's been a long day probably, but we, it, it, it's, it's great to see how it happens. The good and the bad, the difficulties, and, uh, uh, but yet the triumph of God's word in every situation. So first we go to Thessalonica, don't we? In verse 1, when Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. And so they come from Philippi, uh, where we left them last week, and they travelled this journey through Amph Amphipolis, to Amphipolis, which is about 50, 30 miles, 30-odd 30 miles, and then to Apollonia, which is another 30-odd miles from there, and then again, they come to Thessalonica, which is another 30-odd miles to there. All, all together, about a 100-mile journey along this road called the Via Ignatia. That's a history lesson for you here. That was one of the Romans' roads. What did the Romans ever do for us? They built great roads. It was, it was their superhighway. It was the way of getting trade and armies and people from the Aegean Sea over to the Adriatic Sea. A superhighway, right? It might have been just cobbles and stuff, but to them, that's what it was. And uh, so um, Paul and, and Silas, they go past these towns. We don't know why they went past there, but they were being led by God and his Holy Spirit. Some people think because there was a synagogue, they, they always kind of looked for a synagogue to go and start the witness in an area. And we'll come to that in a second. But 
maybe that's the reason why they didn't stop there. We actually don't know, so it's no point really, I won't spend any more time thinking about it, because the Bible, if he wanted us to know it, God would have told us, wouldn't he? But he didn't uh, through his word. And so we see Thessalonica, this big city, 200,000 odd people, a, a free city. Again, there's lots we could say about that, but I don't want to spend too much time there. You can go and read the history if you like. It's interesting, because they, they were very much a Greek sort of thinking city in a Roman Empire at that, in that area. And so they kind of had a slightly different uh, viewpoint on things to some of the other cities that Paul went to. But he, as we'll see as he goes to Athens next time, you know, he's kind of, he, he's, again, the word of God in every situation is applicable. And so it is, it's a port and uh, a lot of through traffic from there as well. And uh, so we see what Paul does, verses 2 down to verse 4 as he goes there. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some important words there we'll come to in a second. But as we said, he starts off at the synagogue, which is kind of where he, his, his kind of MO was. He'd go to the synagogue first. He'd find an open door. And obviously in Philippi, where he's just been, that didn't happen. So where he went there was down by the riverside. He, Paul would go wherever God opened the door. That's his, it was an open door policy. Wherever he went, he would go find a, a, an open door where there was people who he perhaps would be able to work with. And as we find here, he goes to the synagogue where he would expect a welcome because he was a Jew. And, and, and he had that kind of connection there uh, as well. And so he goes in there to, to this, as is, was his custom. I always think this is great. The other person you read that about in the scriptures is Jesus, who goes to the synagogue as was his custom. And Paul often didn't get a very good and easy ride in the synagogue, and neither did Jesus. Think of Jesus going to Nazareth, his hometown. He's one of our own, you know, he's come back home. And he didn't get a very good ride there. They wanted to kill him, throw him off a cliff by the time he'd finished. Didn't go that well, really, did it for him? But, but in one sense it did, because even though Jesus knew, and Paul knew, that in those synagogues, they weren't going to find the life that they needed. They needed to turn to, to follow Jesus, and follow Christ. They still went there. It was a custom. They went to church, if you like. Uh, I don't know whether there's anything we can learn from that. Sometimes we feel we're not really wanting to go, but we need to be where God wants us to be, and particularly on his day, on the Sabbath days. And they spent three Sabbath days there. That's three weeks. Some commentators argue. They argue about everything, commentators, don't they? But commentators argue about how long he was there, but most people think around about a month at the most he stayed there and reasoned with them, as I say. We'll come to that in a second. Uh, so he's only there for months, setting up a preaching and teaching ministry to equip this young church with as much teaching as he possibly could. How can he best help this church to get strong in Jesus? How can he best help this church to become a strong, thriving church? Oh, this is the way you do it, through teaching and preaching and explaining and proving and proclaiming the word of God, because that's where the power and woe betide any churches that try to do it any different to that. And there are many that will try to do that and water it down and make it, um, it, from our point of view, more acceptable. Paul didn't do that. He wanted to preach Christ and he wanted to preach it in a synagogue where he wasn't always guaranteed a good welcome. And we find that here as well in a moment or two. But he still preached the word faithfully and believed in its power to change people's hearts and minds. And this is the way he did it. He reasoned with them from the scriptures. This is kind of, the word for reason is a bit like a, a Bible study, discussion type thing, he, a Q&A. He would, he would, it would backwards and forwards. So there was a sense in which he did proclaim, as we've got that word there as well, preach the word to them, but also sat with them. And the, the trendy word for it these days is discipled these new believers by arguing and, 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 and speaking the truth to them in this way, explaining, proving from the scriptures, proving from the scriptures who, he, who Jesus was. 
And Jesus does that himself, doesn't he? Remember the men on the road to, the, to um, Emmaus? And he comes alongside them. And what does he do? Remember the scriptures that all they had, by the way, was the Old Testament. They didn't have any of the Gospels or anything at this point. And Jesus as well, coming along those, alongside those two despondent disciples on the road to Emmaus. What does he do? He begins with Moses and teaches them all about him. The scriptures that they had. Proving. He's, not, he's confident that the scriptures will, uh, aren't going to fail him in any way. He's going to be able to prove who Jesus was through the scriptures and proclaiming him. Paul believed in the authority of God's word. The absolute authority of God's word. Let's not try and find a different way around this to get at these people. No, let's preach it as it says. Let's trust in the word that God has given us. Even the difficult bits of the Old Testament as they point towards the Christ who is to come. Paul knew it because it was real to him. He knew all this because he was a great, you know, he was, he, was, he was a scholar, wasn't he? He'd studied under Gamaliel. It was his kind of, you know, he, he'd been to the right school. It's like saying, I've been to Cambridge. I know my stuff. And he knew all of that. And he knew all the arguments against what, you know, he persecuted Christians. He'd completely um, tried to destroy the church. He hated them. And then God, through his son Jesus, meets him on the road to Damascus and his word speaks into his heart and he's never the same again. Even the foulest and most difficult, you've heard this before, I'm sure, because somebody's preached on this at some point in the past few weeks. But what an amazing transformation. That's the word of God, folks. That's what it does. It changes us. Well, Paul was not preaching a wishy-washy thing here. He was spending time discussing it so that these people, these new Christians, understood how important and how much he, he trusted in God's word and was able to stake his life on it. But not just the new Christians, the ones who needed to hear it perhaps for the first time, to be persuaded. And we hear later on, of course, that some of them were. Paul preached a robust gospel message. He, he said, hadn't he, to the Romans, he wrote a letter later on to the Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed. Why would I be ashamed of it? It's, what, it's what's given me life. Why would you be ashamed of it? Because it's what's given you life as well. You wouldn't be here but for the gospel of Christ, but for the word of God. I'm not ashamed of it, says Paul. I'm not ashamed of it to speak about it in the church, but I'm also not ashamed of it to speak about it in the marketplace outside. However much trouble it gets me into. Because the gospel is the same whether it's in the church or the marketplace. I believe, Paul says, it's relevant here, but it's also relevant in the, in the marketplace, in the world outside. And that world needs to hear it. And we see again many times during the book of Acts. And it gets them into trouble at times. And we'll see this again here. Because in the church, if you like, in the synagogue where it should have been fairly safe, it wasn't all that safe for them. But first, I wonder how confident we are in the power of God's word. I wonder whether we really, really trust it. Do we really believe in that robust gospel message? that can still change lives today? What are we hoping will change the lives of the people we know who need to come to Christ? What are we hoping that will change the lives of the people who come in, uh, into the church during the week? What should all of our activities be about? What should all of our personal evangelism be about? Yes, it's about talking about what God has done for us, but we, we, we exalt him through his word as we preach it to people. People need to understand what God, who God is, who his son is, and what he's done for us. The good news of the gospel, don't we? The authority of God's word, that's what he preached. And he, he tells us what he actually preached very simply. The Messiah had to suffer. These were Jews, of course, and didn't think that Messiah should have to suffer. So he says, yes, the Messiah had to suffer because you're a, it's a sinful world. The, 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 he was a servant king. He came as a suffering servant. And so he, pro he proves that from the Old Testament. Of course, we see that and we sort of take that on board. But for their culture, that was a huge thing. But Paul was not ashamed of it. No, this Messiah that you're looking for is here. He's, be he's come and he is the one who suffered and gave himself. So he had to suffer. But there was a resurrection. He preached the resurrected Lord. That's why it's so important. That the resurrection is preached alongside the cross, isn't it? Because we preach, uh, we, we speak of an ascended, triumphant king. Not a dead prophet or something who said a few good things, who could advise us about our life. But no, 
a, a resurrected Lord who will completely transform our life and give us new life. Not just for now, but for eternity. And then he talks about the man I proclaim to you, the man, Jesus Christ. It's all about him and what he's done. That's the, that's the basics of it, really, isn't it? So Paul, this very robust arguments, teaching the gospel uh, and, and proving it for it and, and total and utter confidence that the word of God is enough through the Holy Spirit's work in this situation. He's discharging his duty, if you like, no matter what it costs him. Verse 4 to 9, we see the reaction to this. And it's mixed as it always is. One of the principles we've, one of the big principles we read in Acts of the Apostles is the gospel preaching will always divide. Don't be surprised when it does. It will always divide people. The word of God preached will always divide people. Some of the Jews, verse 4, uh, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and, Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, that place again, and formed a mob and started a riot in the city. A divided response, as always. Excuse me, we'll come to that in a second. But interesting word that some of the Jews were persuaded... Um, persuaded means that they believed the words that Paul spoke. Not because Paul was necessarily eloquent, because he actually says, I didn't come with eloquence. Doesn't he elsewhere in Corinthians? I think He didn't come with a powerful ministry and eloquence and all of that, but with the Spirit of God and its power. And the whole, he, he spoke the word with confidence. He spoke the word totally trusting and believing in it. And God, through his Holy Spirit, did the rest in these people. And it was God's word that persuaded them, not Paul. And they were persuaded. The religious ones, some of them were persuaded. Only some. Always the way. Only some of them were persuaded. But we see the word of God here at work. Paul is doing the talking. Paul is doing the explaining. Paul is doing whatever he can to persuade them in one sense. And he's knowing the Bible good enough and being confident in what he's saying. And presenting them only the word. And leaving the results to our Father in heaven. Through his Holy Spirit. There's method for us there, isn't there, as well, as, we, as he does that. And then these God-fearing Gentiles, God-fearing Greeks. Maybe they'd had some earlier uh, exposure to the gospel. Maybe they'd heard about Jesus or whatever from some point or other. But, but a, a number of them are saved and, and brought into God's kingdom through his word speaking. The Holy Spirit working in them. And it says a few prominent women. It mentions this a few times. And a specific thing. Prominent women, it's a strange phrase really, isn't it? Because we, we just don't quite understand what it means. And some people think, well, actually, a lot of the women in the Greek culture were well-versed in the Greek culture and what have you, which actually promoted the degrading of women in many ways uh, for sexual acts and all of that sort of thing. And it usually did that. And as they hear this wonderful, uh, life-affirming and, and, and wondrous gospel of grace and love, and hear it from the words of Scripture and the authoritative word as it's preached and the Holy Spirit works in their hearts, they respond to that. Perhaps for the first time feeling valued as people, uh, people who are made in the image of God. We don't really know, but they know that it, it, uh, Luke mentions this on a number of occasions. Luke's gospel is full as well. If it, it, his, one of his characteristics of his gospel is how many times he talks about the women who believed. And we see it here again in, in his in his account here in the Acts of the Apostles. And the gospel is for all. You know, the gospel is for everyone. Lifts people up. God's image bearers. A positive reaction to the word. So here in this difficult city environment, with this fledgling church, God's word is at work through a faithful servant who is not afraid to preach it and trust God for it. But on the other side, as we say, it divides. And along comes persecution. These jealous Jews. Now, the word for jealous is very similar to the word for zealous. So it could be translated either way. Either way, they were, they were blinkered in the sense that they were. That there's no way we're going to ever, to ever believe this, if you like. I no way we're going to take this on board. But even if they disagreed with him at that level, their response to this, as you read it here, is a hate-filled response. Hysterical, isn't it? Above and beyond anything, they go out and deliberately get a crowd together to try and form a mob 
and make up stories about what's going on with, the, with, with these people. It, it's, it's kind of, it, it's, it's a madness in many ways. And in, in some senses, it's demonic in character. As Satan uses this sort of crowd situation to do this. There was a book written uh, years ago, and I, I didn't read it all, but I've read some of it by a fellow called Charles Mackay. Called, part of the title is called The Madness of Crowds. And he writes this, we find the ho that whole communities suddenly fix their minds upon one object and go mad with its pursuit, that millions of people become simultaneously impressed with one delusion and run after it till their attention is caught by some new folly and cap that are more captivating than the first. If ever there was a way of describing our world, that's kind of it really, isn't it? A madness in crowds. And you see this all over the place, don't you? How crowds can turn, the danger of crowds. Jesus didn't like crowds that much, really, because of that. He was never impressed by the crowds. Isn't it strange how we are impressed by the number of people? We're, we're numbers mad, us lot, because we feel kind of an identity with the crowd rather than identity with the one, Jesus himself. And even us as Christians, we can be a bit obsessed with crowds. How, full you, how many do you get worshipping with you? When you go to conferences as a pastor, it's one of the first questions they ask you. It's kind of, it puts you, you, you kind of find in a pecking order and you see how many you get in your church every time, you know, kind of thing. That's the thing, because that's what matters, isn't it? Of course it's not. Well, in one sense it does, because we want more people to be saved. But really what we need to know how well a church is doing is how well the word is preached and listened to and responded to and, and applied in people's lives. That's how you know. But anyway, here we have... But we've seen this kind of crowd and mayhem that Paul has to deal with here in Thessalonica. We've seen it before, haven't we? You go back to Jesus on trial, Pilate and the crowd, who a week or so earlier, many had been saying, Hosanna to the King of Kings. He's our saviour. Come and save us. And here they are, a few days later, whipped up by the, uh, the leaders at the time, who were undermined by the demonic activity that was going on, this cosmic battle that was taking place, to saying, crucify this man. And awful things like his blood be on our hands and on our children. I mean, where does that come from? It can only come from the pit, can't it? Why would people act like that? Why would they say that? Paul's come with the gospel of good news. Some people have reacted and think it's the most wonderful thing and have been saved. And the opposite, hatred and the reaction hysterical but we shouldn't be surprised because satan is at work in all of these things too isn't it and trying to undermine it and so we see something of this today don't we opposition and persecution is natural it's 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 as it's as common as as uh, you know, we believe that god's word will provoke a response and sometimes that response is opposition in this way and today we see in our council culture don't we hear the madness of crowds here don't we we see in verse six poor jason who's kind of, he looked after the, Paul. We don't real, realize, we don't get told where Paul and Silas were, but Jason gets dragged out of his house, dragged before the authorities. He's done nothing wrong. He's offered hospitality to God's servants. And yet he's been dragged before the courts for it. Is this the trouble, is this the trouble that Jesus said we'd have in the world as we preach his word faithfully? Yes, we can trust it. Yes, we can believe in it, and yes, we can expect God to bear, it to bear fruit, but we can also expect this opposition. Are we ready for that? Are we willing to stand firm on the word of God? Because the word is at work, we will see these things happen. The word's at work. It talked, they talked about him, he's proclaiming another king. Well, of course he is. It's, he's proclaiming the kingdom of God. It's no threat to a world, really. That, that it, it, it's kind of, it shouldn't be a threat to anybody, but this is another king. And they make it a, 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 between him and Caesar, and so therefore that's the justification for calling all of these um, rioters out on the streets. But this kingdom, this, uh, one of the, uh, you know, um, Strange things that they say. These are the men who've come and turned the world upside down, if you read it in the ESV, in verse 6 there. But actually, they've come to turn it the right side up, in that sense. But the totalitarian rule of those their day wouldn't have this. And our world won't have it either. They don't want us to preach about another king. They don't want us to preach about another God who we serve. 
who we come before humbly and receive his word and receive his forgiveness and receive his salvation. Because they want, this world wants another king. In fact, it wants a lot of other kings. It wants itself to be king. And the people in this world want to be king. That's the lie of Satan, that we can do that. We can be the masters of our, our destiny, isn't it, really? So the world won't have it. Their world wouldn't have it. And there's always going to be opposition to the word. These kingdoms that we talk about will clash. God's kingdom and the kingdom of this world. But God is in the business of turning that world right side up. The gospel will always divide. The word will always do its work. It will expose people's hearts. So don't be surprised. And then interestingly, at the end of this es es escapade in Thessalonica, they, they, because this trouble was there, and after Jason had been released and what have you, they sent them away, sent Paul and Silas away. They didn't, you, you, a lot of people would have said, this is spiritual warfare. We need to get a prayer meeting going and start. Sanctified common sense says we need to send these guys away so that the gospel can go. So there was no prayer meeting in that sense. And there wasn't one in Berea later on as well as we move on to that. Verses 10 onwards, let's read. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away down to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now, Berea is very different to, in lots of ways to Thessalonica. Berea is a, a Thessalonica crumbs, is a huge place with 200,000 odd people, a big metropolis. Berea is kind of off the beaten track. They've gone down, apparently, the Via Ignatia, carried on for another uh, sort of 30 miles or so, and then turned off it towards the sea, ended up in this village, which they, they were aiming for, apparently, which is about 20 miles away from that. So now a village or a, a town of about 6,000 people, much smaller. And there they go to the Jewish synagogue again. again. And there's an open door there for them. And the difference here is what we should be praying for for all of our churches. There is a real hunger for God's word. There's no greater sort of thing that we ought to be praying for, for our, for our brothers and sisters, for our friends, is that we might have, and particularly as Christians, one another, that we might have a hunger for God's word. And we see it here, verse 11. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the, uh, the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see what Paul, if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women, again there's Luke's emphasis there, and many Greek men. Okay. The Bereans were hungry for the word. Look how it describes them. They received it eagerly they examined it daily to make sure the preacher's on the ball that's a great thing to do you, you know you need to be doing that all the time and also it, it talks about them being more noble it just means that noble word is is a strange translation really but it really means that they their minds were ready to listen they had an open sort of mind they wanted to hear it was good soil to use jesus analogy in the in the uh, parable that he told they were good soil, fertile ground, hungry for God's word. We need to pray for it, folks. We need to pray for it for ourselves. We, want, we need to pray that we don't get so full on other things that we're not hungry enough for God's word. We need to pray that we don't get so distracted by the latest fad or whatever in church circles and things, and we lose our hunger for God's word. Hunger to be with his people. Hunger to have our ears open. Hunger to have our hearts filled. Because only God, can, only God can prepare the ground in that way. So we need to pray for it. And we need to pray for one another for that. Keep us hungry, Lord. Keep us hungry for your word. So are we. And how do you receive God's word? Just as a little aside, Jesus talked about this. Luke records it again in his, his gospel. Luke 8, verse 18. Be careful how you listen, he says. Because for those, you know, much has been given, much will be, you know, be taken. And those who've only been given little, or can only, only want to take little, even that might be taken away from them. There's a warning there. If we want to be filled with the word of God, then God will add to it. But if we're only happy with a slice here and there, then maybe God will take even, that will even be taken away from us. But more importantly, be careful how you listen. Luke 8, verse 18. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's all over the scriptures, isn't it? 
If God's given you and opened your eyes and your ears to hear what he's saying to you through the Spirit, then use them. Use them always. Be hungry for God's word. It's our protection. It's our power. It, it gives us our passion for him. If we have ears to hear, use them. In both receiving, like the Bereans, and examining the word. Years ago, I remember, we, you know, we, we, the charismatic age, well, it's still sort of here, isn't it? But in the 80s and what have you, when growing up in that time, there's a lot of stuff that was going on that was kind of really confusing to me as a young Christian. And I thank God by his grace. I, I think something happened. I won't go into all the details of it, but something happened that really confused me. I didn't know, what, and I knew that God wouldn't do it the way it was being said. But I couldn't prove it anyway. And, and it made me go back to the scriptures. Thank God that he put his spirit in me to go back there and say, what does your word actually say about this, Lord? And it changed everything the way I thought. Because I was able to reason with it through the scriptures. Now, I'm not bigging myself up there. I praise God that he put me in that position. And sometimes you will come across things and you'll hear things and you're not sure. That's why we need a hunger for God's words. So we understand what he's doing in situations. And we'll, his word will always satisfy, but there'll always be more. Don't ever think we've got it all tapped off. It We won't. The Holy Spirit will feed us constantly through his word. The preached word and personal study as well. And look what it says. It says, therefore, they were hungry for God's word. They examined God's word. They, they, they listened to it faithfully. And it says, therefore, as a result, many believed. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? That the more we receive God's word with gratitude, the more our faith will increase as Christians, but the more people will believe. We should expect people to come to faith because of God's word. Of course we do. That's why the word of God builds churches. It, it, it wins people for Christ, but it also equips the saints. That's why we should never look anywhere else. And we need to, but we need to do our part. It's, past, it's pastor and preacher and congregation together. So how well do you listen? How well, what are you? Be careful how you listen to God's word. As some whoever preaches from this pulpit, be careful how you listen. Make sure you make the most of every opportunity you can to hear it and to study it and to examine it yourself. Only through the word of God at work. So do we trust the power of God at work through his word? Do we expect God to work through his word? Do we trust its authority? And again, women, women's ministry. I think the reason it's mentioned then, sometimes in, in churches... You know, uh, in the past, it's been that women's ministry has sort of happened on the side somewhere. Women's ministry is word ministry, folks. We need strong women and men in the word. I know we have different ways in which we do things as a church, and I'm not going to get into all of that tonight in terms of roles and responsibilities. But we all, women and men, need to be strong in the word of God as we minister to one another. And women's, a good women's ministry in a church is a word ministry. The word at work. A hunger here. But on the other side of that again, hatred. Verses 13 to 15. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea, 50 odd miles away, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. What kind of hatred does that? All that way. 50, you know, they weren't going on a car just down the road. It took them days to get there. Determined to agitate the crowds and stir them up. They followed for them over 50 miles. Such hatred for Christ and his word can only come from one place. And so we're in a battle, aren't we? It's irrational, that sort of behavior, apart from Satan's working. He hates Jesus this much. And he wants to oppose the work of God through his word that much. If we see anything in Acts, we can see it time and time again, Carl. And so we needn't be surprised by it at all. Opposition is also a therefore. Just as people believing is a therefore when we preach God's word, so the opposition will be. Therefore, there will be opposition. It will happen. Agitating, stirring up. It's, it is spiritual warfare. So how do we deal with this? They don't have a prayer time again. They send them away. They do a runner. They get off again. And Paul goes off to Athens, and you'll pick that up next Sunday. And carries on there, doesn't he? 
So that's what they did twice, no powerful prayer meeting. What do we do here? Well, we need to turn to Ephesians 6. We don't need to turn to it because we're not going to read it because we haven't got much time to do that tonight. But Ephesians 6, we need the armour of God, don't we? That's what God says. That's how we deal with these things. We put on all of the wonderful things that God has given to us, a breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the feet shod with the gospel of peace, the belt that supports us of truth and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How do we defend ourselves? How do we attack, if you like, the evil one? Uh, through the Word of God, through preaching the Word of God, through speaking the Word of God, through being hungry myself for the Word of God. That will protect me as the evil one comes towards me. It's powerful. It will divide. Righteous of the Hebrews says the same thing. For the word of God is living and active. We know this verse, don't we? Sharper than a two-edged sword. Piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, to the discerning of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No wonder it stirs a response. We should be surprised if the word of God doesn't stir a response. If there wasn't any response to it, maybe we need to wonder how, whether we're really preaching the word of God or not. So sometimes the, the church's response to that has been, well, if, we'd pre if the word of God is getting that kind of hatred response, we need to change the word of God. So how can you reconcile that with Hebrews 4 and verse 12? Where this word of God is meant to separate. It's meant to pierce the division of our soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And it's meant to discern the thoughts of our heart. It's meant to expose the wickedness that's there. And for those who, through the grace of God, accept it, it heals that wickedness and everything that's there and cleanses it and makes us wise for salvation and lifts us from the miry clay and sets our feet upon the rock and makes our footsteps firm. Praise God that it does that and protects us and equips us to go forward. But for those who reject it, it becomes like a poison in them in some ways. The word at work, we need to release it Release it in our own lives by studying it and like the Bereans and as we read there, to trust it, to hunger after it, to feed on it, to be confident in it, to stand firm on it and folks to rejoice in it. Rejoice in God's word. Rejoice in the wonderful things that you hear and read in that word. It will divide, of course it will. It will be opposed, but it will also, by the grace of God, produce fruit that will last and that's what we pray for the word of God at work and we know it we see it we see it in our world today we see it as we read these verses here don't we we'll see it next week as you go into looking at Athens and what goes on there I'd love to be able to preach your Athens I love that bit but somebody else is getting that one so never mind we'll go on with this but this this is it's wonderful to see the word of God at work but let's not be naive that as God's word is preached we need to stand firm in the armour of God, wielding the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us this evening. And Lord, the challenge, Lord, to be hungry for your words, and Lord, not to be distracted by other things. So we pray for ourselves, first and foremost, Lord, for our churches, that we would have hungry churches, Lord, hungry Christians longing to hear God's word, longing to hear your word speaking into our lives, making us wise for salvation, equipping us for every good work. Lord, give us that faith and trust in your word, that we would walk in it, we'd rejoice in it, we'd trust it in every way, Lord, and we'd expect it to work in our, in our lives and in the lives of those we speak it to. But Lord, help us in the days, in, in the battle that we face, because Lord, we are in a battle, and we do know, Lord, that as we preach your word, there will be opposition and sometimes unreasonable opposition, and we'll find it difficult. But we thank you, Lord, that you have given us the armor that you gave us, Lord, to stand in, your righteousness, your truth, your uh, salvation, Lord. And, Lord, we pray that you would help us to stand firm in that, Lord, wielding your word as the sword of the Spirit. Father, you'd help us to be um, more than conquerors in all these things through your word. So, Lord, help us, we pray. And we pray this, Lord, not for our glory and not for the church's glory, but for your glory, so that you will bring many sons to glory from this world.
drag them out of darkness and bring them into your glorious light. That's what we pray for, Lord, and we know your word will do it. So we pray, Father, for its effectiveness in our lives and in our fellowships. And we ask this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so let's sing our final hymn together, our final